Our scripture reading this morning comes from, again, the book of Ecclesiastes, just after the Psalms and Proverbs, uh, is the book of Ecclesiastes. And our reading today is going to come from chapter 9, the verses 11 through 18. And we invite you to keep your Bibles open as uh, we are going to look at portions of the whole chapter. But our reading purposes this morning is verses 11 through 18. And again, a reminder, uh, Solomon is penning this towards the end of his life, and he's given some reflections on how life has transpired. And he once again sets for us a tension, as it were, a wrestling that as he's looked back on life and he's thought about all that's important in life, he introduces once again, I think, a tension that we can all relate to, that that phenomenon of good things happening to bad people and bad things happening to good people and our sense of fairness. How do we deal with that? What are we going to do about that? So again, some of these reflections, the verses 11 through 18, I know you just sat down, but we're going to stand for the reading of God's Word as you're able to. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For a man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time and it suddenly falls upon them. I've also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. It was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. There was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in a quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Thus far the reading of God's word, you may be seated. Many of us had the opportunity in the last month and a half to uh, take in some of the Olympics that took place in Paris. And one can imagine being an athlete on this incredible world stage competing at this level. Of course, with four years in between each Olympics, you know there's a lot that goes into preparing and being ready for the Olympics. One such group of athletes was the U.S. men's relay team. And again, there was high hopes for this group of guys to win or at least place or at least medal. So the race commences and they're making their way around the track. And of course, those of you who are familiar with relay team and running relays, you hand the baton off as you're running. As this race commences, and many of you know what happens, the unthinkable happened. The one potential flaw in such a race transpired on the international stage. These trained athletes worked so hard for this moment, in a split second, the baton dropped, and they were immediately disqualified. In a moment, just a a brief moment, in, in, in what would be considered almost a fatal flaw, the race was done for the U.S. runners. And the cameras, of course, as they are, zoom in on the athletes. And there's despair, there's frustration, there's disappointment. One mistake, four years of preparation, 
one mistake ended that effort. Now, I don't run races, so I can't relate necessarily to those athletes. But I do think there's a little bit in all of us that can attest to sometimes the efforts we put forth, the dreams, the plans we have, the good we're trying to affect in in a world that struggles, and then to feel like you come up empty, like it was all for nothing, gone in a moment. Things like that trigger in all of us a bit of sense of maybe it's despair, maybe it's frustration, maybe we get angry, we get bitter, maybe there's fault finding, but we just don't like that, do we? Well, you're not alone. Solomon kind of puts some words to it as well. You know, here's the swift runner and yet... He's not always guaranteed the race. Here's the strong and mighty warrior, but he's not always guaranteed the victory. Here's a wise man that works hard day after day, and yet he's not guaranteed bread for his family. There are those who go to school and attain an education and they're the smartest of their class and yet they lack at times the wisdom needed for the moment. And Solomon says time and chance happen to all. Time and chance. Much of our world today wrestles with this reality of time and chance. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 9, I want to point out some things to give some context to Solomon's observations in verse 11. But to get some of that, let's go back to verse 1. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. And we'll come back to that verse in just a moment. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. And now he goes into these next verses. I want you to listen to this. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears as he who shuns an oath, there is an evil in all that is done under the sun that the same event happens to them all. In fact, he goes on, he says, The hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. When I've done street ministry in New Orleans and New York City, this issue comes up again and again and again. Why would a good God... Allow bad things to happen. And I always tell people, I said, that's a super fair question. And it's an angst all of us feel. And maybe even profoundly more so we as believers, because we know God is good. The word tells us that God is good. But we, even we, God's people, Chosen and loved, dearly loved by God. Have bad things happen to us? And so I even think that as believers, the tension is even deeper. We maybe even feel it more profoundly. 
We testify that God is good all the time and that all the time God is good. We sing of the goodness of our God. He's our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We declare these things and then we show up to work Monday morning. And wham! Feels like an awful word. How do we wrestle well with this? The good and the bad happening to the good and the evil. And not only how do we live, but how do we communicate this to a world that has trouble coping with that reality? I want to make some observations that are drawn from Ecclesiastes 9. Uh, We're going to pull in some of what we talked about last week from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. The first observation is this. Our uncertainty is not God's fault. It's not God's failure. I want you to think about this for a moment. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. And we try to, in the wisdom that we have, to make sense of it. Okay, that's our, our natural inclination, right? We want to make sense of why these things happen in the world. And more so, partially because we want to fix it, right? A whole bunch of us are fixers, aren't we? We don't like tension. We don't like these things unresolved and uncertain things. We want to get in there. We want to fix it. And we want it done now. That's part of the challenge. I think part of it, too, is a genuine desire within the believer's heart to say, God, there's evil in this world. Why can't there be good? Why does this evil have to happen? Why does death and sickness and car accidents and cancer and all these horrible things have to happen? Why do your people have to experience this? And sadly, there's even some within the evangelical church community that we would even dare to say, well, if you just had enough faith. That's not biblical, by the way. The reality is, good things are going to happen to bad people and bad things are going to happen to good people, but that's not God's failure. See, the the, the part of the challenge in all of this is that we have a reality that we observe, circumstances we experience, we have feelings, emotions, and observations, but they are finite. There's There's only so far, and then we don't see beyond that. We don't get the privilege of looking beyond that. And some of you may be sitting here right now in the midst of these circumstances and you're wondering what the world is coming. And you can't see beyond this point. So this is called the field of uncertainty. We we don't know what's next. But that uncertainty is not God's failure. So why do I say it's not God's failure? failure. Because how many times in the human experience, believer and unbeliever, bad stuff happens and our first inclination is, why God? Right? Come on, God, what's going on here? As if to say, God, somehow, some way, you blinked and it went wrong. And we're, we're trying to pull God into what we know. But don't give him our uncertainty. So we try to make God fit our circumstances, our feelings, our moments. And when that doesn't fit, we say, God messed up. The reality is... The issue is not God. The issue is our surrender. Yes, we are finite people. 
Yes, we are broken people. Yes, we mess up. Yes, we experience bad things. And we only get to see so much. And you can choose one of two paths at this point. And we'll get into this in just a moment a little bit more. You can either blame God or blame others, point fingers, cite excuses, or you can surrender. Say, God, I don't understand this. I don't get this. It doesn't make sense. I don't know why you're allowing this to happen in my life. You're not, why are you allowing this to happen in our country? Why are you allowing all? Because you see, in the place of surrender is where we find our peace. Because some of the, the, the challenge that comes with these uncertainty is we want to fix it because if we fix it, then we figure we got peace. The better path, folks, is to start with surrender to God and allow His peace to set in. Then we go look at our circumstances. See, we want to organize our circumstances to make sense here so that thinking, if it makes sense here, I'm good here. When the reality is we're not getting get to good here until we start with surrender, then look at our circumstances. And that doesn't mean we're automatically going to make sense of everything, but we're certainly going to have peace going into trying to make sense of everything. But I want to think on this just a little bit more from a slightly different angle. And again, if you look at verse 1, it says, I laid this to heart examining it, how the righteous and the wise in their deeds are in the hand of God. See, even Solomon recognizes that in his kind of hindsight, there was so much of his life he didn't start with the surrender. He didn't start with the reality, my life is in God's hands. But rather, he just simply embraced the life of the here and now and trying to make most of it. And then was trying to wrestle with this empty feeling he had later in life. And here he tips his hand to say, oh, <laughs> this is where we got to start. My life in God's hands. That's what I'm going to have peace. And then verse 4, he says all this, but he who is joined with all the living has hope. The writer Solomon is saying here, look, I have life and breath. My life is in God's hands. That's where my hope comes from. My hope isn't defined by having all these circumstances make sense for everything to be pleasant and positive and warm and fuzzy. My peace comes from the fact that my life is in his hands. My hope comes from there. But let's give that a, a little more thought. It's interesting how Solomon uh, kind of describes this insanity. We'll, we'll just call it that, insanity. Okay? You know, the, the good and the evil happening to everyone. And then the, 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 the race doesn't belong to the swift, the, 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 the battle doesn't belong to the strong, all of that. And he calls it evil. Isn't it interesting? He calls it evil. Why? Why does he call it evil and what do we make of this? Because he kind of puts, put this, coins this phrase of time and chance happens to all. And he feels it's evil. And again, part of what he's trying to wrestle with, especially later in life, reflecting back is, okay, if my life is in God's hands, and that's where I get my peace, then why at times do I feel so miserable? Why is it that, that, that I can trust in God, I can... You know, maybe go through all the motions. I can go to church. I can give. I can serve. I can do all those things. But why does it feel at times that the, the world is so unfair? And my circumstances feel so unfair. 
And so, understandably, the first word that kind of comes to Solomon's mind is, well, this has got to be evil. (laughs) It can't be of God. And there again, we have to put some perspective on this, where the evil of time and chance rests not in a faulty God, but a man-centered reality. What do I mean by that? Go back to Genesis for a minute. Consider a minute the temptation of Satan to Adam and Eve. Satan came into that garden, not in full battle gear. He came subtly, almost quietly, and gently took Adam and Eve's eyes off of God and put them on themselves. Did God really say? Nah. You're going to be just like him. Thus, this evil of time and chance enters human existence. Because what now happens is the fact that the inclination of man is towards a man-centered reality. I am the keeper of my time. I am the keeper of my ways. I am the end all be all. And what happens is, and we all fall temptation to this, is so the bad happens, but we translate that bad as to how it affects me first. And understandably so. It's very tempting, very inviting, as it were, almost, that that this bad thing happened, it impacts me, therefore, I'm, I'm looking at this bad thing from these man-centered eyes. And I can promise you, if your reality continually is shaped by translating the bad of the world that happens to the good and the evil, and you translate that through this mindset of how it affects me, how it impacts me, how it hurts me, guess what's going to happen? Your world's going to get about that big, And it's going to be filled with bitterness and anger and envy and frustration and disappointment. And it's going to feel like you're stuck. That's the man-centered reality result of total depravity. That's why, for example, when bad happens in the world, several things kick into gear, don't they? Who's to blame and who's going to fix it? Now, to a certain extent, understandable. If something breaks, you you figure out how to fix it, right? But out of this kind of framework, if you're living kind of in a humanistic, man-centered mindset, all you're going to look for is to expend energy on blaming and making someone else fix it. And then if somebody else doesn't fix it, you transfer the blame over to here. And then you transfer it over to here. And you can see this endless cycle of blame, regret, anger, frustration in a man-centered reality. And again, so subtle. But when you take your eyes off the sovereign God, my life in his hands, his purposes in my life. You take your eyes off that. That's the reality that you and I can create. And I think Solomon here, knowing this, this is part of the tension. I think he realized there were so many opportunities for him to keep his eyes fixed on God. But rather with the accolades and, and the, the, the giftings and everything that came his way, how easy it was to just... And let's admit how easy for us sometimes even in our own pain 
and frustration and disappointments for our world to kind of go like this. Zero in on ourselves. See, because against this backdrop of all the bad that happens to good people, God's purposes still are fulfilled. (laughs) And again, our first inclination as believers are like, so your purposes aren't my good? Okay, God, you, you have purposes for me, but I don't get why this bad stuff is happening. I mean, don't you have good purposes for me? And again, remember, we're translating good and bad oftentimes in how it impacts me rather than translating it through a surrendered mindset that says, God, have your way. Which leads me to this last observation. The life fully surrendered into the hands of God will drive man's efforts within this time and chance towards God's glory. And the prime example of this is Jesus. Consider Jesus for a moment. Perfect. Son of God. Seated at the right hand. Had everything. No sin. Comes to this earth. Perfect. Takes on human flesh. And we watch 33 years morph. Filled with pain. Rejection. Ultimately suffering and death. And when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, as it were, ties into this tension that Solomon's talking about. Oh, God, let this cup pass by me. I think there's so many of us that can relate in moments of trouble and sorrow, the thorn in the flesh, the misery at times we have to travel through. Oh, Lord, just... Let this pass. Get it over with. But in the same breath, Jesus, the Son of the living God, says, not my will, but yours be done. The only way, the only way, He moved from the Garden of Gethsemane into the hands of the betrayers, into the hands of the Romans, and up onto that cross was not because it all made sense, not because it felt good, not because everything was working his way. No, every step of the way, he was resisted, he was challenged, he was tried, he was wrongly tried, he was crucified because he was fully surrendered. When Solomon gets to chapter 12 and at the end of chapter 12 and he says, here's the sum of it all, fear God. That's not the end all necessarily. It has to be the all. You and I walking out of this building today are not guaranteed what we're going to come into. I I suspect all of you sitting here today are not thinking, I can't wait till something bad happens today. None of you are thinking that, right? Hopefully. (laughs) But it's back here, isn't it? We all know it can. The question is, Are you going to slip into kind of a man-centered mindset that I'm going to blame, I'm going to argue, I'm going to point fingers, I'm going to point my finger at God? Or in a place of fully surrender, are you going to see the glory of God revealed even in the pain and the suffering? It's one of the reasons Paul said, look, as much as it is up to you, live at peace with one another. 
As much as it is up to you, do good so that those around you do what? Give glory to God. And if there's any moment in human existence that non-believers are watching believers, is how we navigate suffering. How we navigate this tension of bad things happening to good people. See it in the hospital all the time. When you're standing bedside with somebody who's suffering or maybe near death. And, and as God's people, we gather around that bed and we pray and we worship. Sometimes we sing. Time and time again, people walking down the hallway, stop. Some are warm to this idea and, and are drawn in because there's something right going on in there, even though there's something so wrong happening. And others are just simply repulsed because I can't make sense of this. It doesn't fit in my man's set or it doesn't make me feel. You have a choice today how you're going to live your life. You can let the realities of the world kind of filter in and you can create this man-centered reality of bitterness and anger and frustration and finger pointing and all of that. That's how you can live if you want. The stage is set. Total depravity is alive and well. We live in a broken, fallen world. It's easy to to slip into that. Or, even in this moment, you surrender. Say, God, not my will, but yours be done. And come what may. Come what may. I will glorify you. I'll ask you the same question I did at the end of last last week. What does your Ecclesiastes look like? What does your story look like? What will it be? What can you choose today about the world you live in? Let's pray. Lord, we confess to you lives filled with all kinds of emotions right now. Moments we can think of, maybe even moments we're in right now where life feels unfair. We're facing burdens, challenges, health crises. Maybe things we've done and we're reaping the consequences are things that have been done to us. And just as you did through Joshua to the people of Israel, you lay before us life and death. Life surrendered to you, to the God of the universe, the one who is sovereign over all the Savior who marked the way for death. World fill and wallow and fear and bitterness and finger pointing and fault finding and sense of no way out. By your Holy Spirit and by the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. I pray for anyone today for whom this burden is heavy, that by your spirit we would be able to fix our eyes on you, the one who authors and protects our faith, sets us free from fear, sets us free from the burden of a broken world, and where we find our true peace, in the one who has set us free. True peace in the one who makes sense of it all. For your purposes and for your glory, we pray.
Amen.